It's an honor to be here, uh, really to speak on behalf of the Great Third District and Boston Fire Department, Local 718. Um, this event was, it was really something. Um, I would like to uh, get into as much detail as possible. I know you guys are hungry for a lot of this information here. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say, uh, you know, thanks for A. Michael Mullane for allowing me to come up here and, and give the spiel. He was going to come up, but they told me only have 15 minutes, so it'll take him a little bit longer. And it is his birthday today. He's 107. <laughs> so in union years, he's about 150. So if you get a chance to go and say hello to him and, and pick his brain, I'm sure, um, I'm sure he has some valuable information for you. All right, that being said, uh, let's get right down to down and dirty. I, I was not on duty that day. I got a call from Angel Hernandez Sunday afternoon. He's a major league umpire, big friend of the firefighters. He uh, said, I got four tickets for you to, for tomorrow's game, for the Red Sox game. Do you want to go? And I said, absolutely. I asked around my firehouse, I had another guy that would go with me, and then uh, I called my cousin, who's a firefighter on Ladder 29, and he said he's in too. So four of us ended up going, three firefighters, and um, what, a great, you know, what a great start of a beautiful day. We, we started on the green line, which uh, skips a couple stops, and honestly, him and I looked at each other at one point and got a little bit of a pucker effect, because we were on this packed trolley, kids everywhere, um, and it's Patriots Day in Boston. Patriots Day in Boston is a, is a holiday. It, um, it has been since 1775. And the battles of uh, Concord and Lexington started our American Revolution. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a great day of celebration. It's a three-day weekend. Um, that being said, the kids are off school, and everyone's packing in for the only Major League Baseball game that starts at 11 a.m. So we were all going to the, to the Sox game. So as you can, you can see, let me go slide forward here. Um, so what happened? We get out of the game, the Sox won in the bottom of the ninth, we were happy about that. Uh, we didn't trust the train for some reason, it just seemed too packed and we just had that, you know, you have that feeling and, and so we walked back to the firehouse at the corner of um, Boylston and Hereford Street we were going to go have a few more beers. We had a couple at the game. Um, so we were walking up, getting into, going into the bar, getting on the list to go into Dylan's next door and Mikey O'Connor said it's going to be about 40 minutes before you get in. So, all right, we'll walk down the street. So just as we were trying to make our way across Hereford Street, we have to wait for the cops to give us the clear because the runners are still coming. That's when uh, bomb number one exploded at the finish line, about six blocks from where we were. Um, that being Patriots Day, you always see on TV, they do the reenactments of the battles of Concord and Lexington, and they're firing their muskets and everything. That was the first thing that went through our head. And said, you know, there must be cannon fire, or the musket guys must be there at the finish line or something. Because uh, it just didn't, it was, it was muffled, and it was still, you know, a good quarter mile away from us. Then the second one hit, and then there was absolutely, there was, there was, there was no, uh, and nothing in our mind to tell us otherwise that this was some type of terrorist event. This is not good. This is bad. Things are happening. Uh, instantly went through, you know, that situational awareness. I went from absolute denial because I was pissed, because I was having a good time. I was drinking beers with my cousin and my buddies. We were going to hit some bars, and... This guy just, whatever just happened, just ruined this entire day for us. And then instantly went into denial, like, you know, this can't happen. Then it was a quick acceptance. And then we walked in the firehouse and we just heard the screaming on the radio. And um, on the fire radio of just, you know, people down. Um, we heard mass casualty incident. We heard amputations. We heard uh, blood everywhere. I mean, they were very candid with that and, and right up front to say. And then what we do in Boston is, with any type of incident to get as many firefighters there as quickly as possible is say strike the box. So they struck the box, which I'll get into in a, in a minute. So the devices went 13 seconds apart, three fatalities, 264 injuries, 14 leg amputations. Um, and then on up, and a lot of this that you know, seems bad actually went very well. If we can go a slide ahead. Um, so with that, that many people in, in there, we, we did set up a significant pre-plan and the pre-plan is in, you know, in, a, in effect from the beginning of the day where the mobile command post comes out, they start setting up, we have a unified command center, and, and we put additional firefighters on detail all the way from deputy chief in the UCC all the way down to district chiefs, captains, lieutenants, firefighters. All the firefighters are, and, and lieutenants are equipped with um, medical kits that contain you know, a variety of stuff, but obviously there was, we, we, on that day we could have used more, and I'll get into that. So. Um, on top of the fact that you have the marathon with upwards of 25,000 runners, about 17,000 had finished at the point when, when the bomb went off, 
Uh, you have just, just massive crowds of uh, people. As you can see, it's you know, 10 or 15 deep in some places. So what these idiots were thinking was, you know, we're going to take out hundreds of people with these pressure cooker bombs. So what the cowards did was they took their backpacks, they placed one right at near the finish line at Marathon Sports, and the other one three blocks down the street in front of a crowded restaurant. This is all on Boylston Street. It was all on the, the same side of the street, the north side of the street. Um, they, set the, they, placed the, they placed their bags down, and then they made cell phone calls, and they dialed up their bombs to go off, which they both did successfully. So um, in the past, we've had marathons. They got very hot at the end. April is a very strange month in Boston. We've had, I've run a marathon in the snow, and I've run a marathon where I almost passed out from heat. Uh, the, the temperatures and ex extremes can go either way. So we, um, no, we planned for that. So on top of having a medical tent with, with uh, the marathon, marathon all, all along the 26 miles of the route with going through 14 different towns, um, in Boston itself at the end is usually where we have the, the most presence of the medical community, from physicians to nurses to EMTs, paramedics. Um, Boston Fire, Boston Police, and Boston EMS, three separate agencies, and we all do plan for this as an MCI beforehand. Um, we put on extensive staffing. There's cop, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cop that day. They're absolutely everywhere, and uh, you know, as, as we want them to be. It's, it's a big public safety event. On, on top of the, the, the runners, we have the spectators, which grow into the hundreds of thousands. Then you have the Boston Red Sox game let out right around two or three o'clock where the, where the runners are mostly, you know, they're coming through, and uh, the, the majority of the runners are coming through the middle of the pack. And, you know, and then, so you got this one big party of a circus downtown. And if you've never done it, I suggest you go and you know, be part of it. And we're going to want you there next year. And uh, not, you know, we don't have to run it. Don't be ridiculous. That's, that's, that's something you, you just wouldn't want to do. <laughs> I've done it three times now. And, I, and then you know, they say first time is on you, second time is insanity, third time is just stupidity. But uh, no, it's a, it's, it's a great race. You really do feel like you're running along being carried by a support team of hundreds of thousands. It's one of the only races where you, you know, as you run, you know, there's always somebody lifting you up and, and carrying you. And, uh, and that's the whole spirit of this day, you know, from back from 1775 all the way through today. And, and now this is just going to accentuate that in the future. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the response. Um, this thing was over in 30 minutes. The, the, it, was, it was an unbelievable amount of resources there on scene to get this done. By the time I got from the firehouse up to the, where the second, second bomb went off, uh, we were carrying uh, backwards that we stripped from engine 33 and ladder 15's quarters. We were looking for radios. We would like to have had a radio, but we didn't have that, so we really didn't know what was going on. What was interesting is I ran the marathon with my cousin in 2007, just before he came on the job, and we ran it together, and we remember running down Boylston Street, like, oh my God, this is great. Look at this, our family's at the finish line, and you know, it's just happy, joyous day. We finished the marathon, yay. And uh, this year, you know, we ended up running it together that last almost two blocks as people were running at us, covered in blood, screaming, pandemonium, chaos, smoke. Um, it, was, it was just a bizarre world, you know, and I thought about that after. That was one of the things that kept me up at night, like, wow, that, that dichotomy of going from that great a day to this, you know, absolutely tragic day that, that occurred. But, we, you know, we never do anything alone in this job, right? We're always together. And I had my cousin, and I had Jimmy Brooks, and we, we went all at it. And I got to tell you, there wasn't to a man or woman any first responder that ran away from those bombs. And that pucker effect, when we were running that block down from Hereford Street down to Gloucester Street, just waiting, and you know, I teach this stuff too, going around you know, teaching about terrorism, the IFF hazmat. And you know there's another device. There has to be, and there's always a second device. Well, in this case, the second device went 13 seconds. So now we're thinking there's a third device or a fourth device. And that, and that wasn't played in the back of your mind. And as far as situational awareness was, I completely lost it when it came to that. Because once you see somebody missing legs, that goes right out the window. And you just do what you got to do. And that's what everybody did. Um, so why was there such, a, you know, a, a, such a, a, a limited loss of life? There's a lot of factors there. Um, number one is we have hospitals basically everywhere. And there's four adult trauma centers and four pediatric trauma centers within a two-mile radius of ground zero of this bomb. So, Literally, it, it's, you, they couldn't have done it in a better place. You got Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, Mass General, Boston Medical Center. Then on top of that, you have Children's and you have Tufts for the kids. Plus, they'll, the other major Mass General will take children as well. So it's like seven level one trauma centers right there. Ambulances, as far as the eye can see. And a good point, I, 
we uh, thought about was that because of the heat exhaustion in the years past, they've added a bunch of staff with the capabilities of starting IVs, and they put a bunch of wheelchairs, you know, hundreds of wheelchairs at the finish line in the medical tent, which made a, made a huge difference in get, just getting these people cleared out. Um, so right off the bat, when we say we strike the box, we're getting, you're getting like four, eight engines, five ladders, a heavy rescue, five chiefs officers. That's actually a second alarm response, and that was pretty quick. Uh, it'd be half that on the first alarm. Quickly went to a second alarm. Fire was told to go directly down Boylston Street, and in years past, they, they did have an incident where we went down Boylston Street and we got yelled at pretty good by the mayor. Don't interrupt that marathon. I don't want always going, I don't care if whatever. So there was actually this like, when you see en engine 33 go down Boylston Street, right through that, near that finish line of that marathon, then you know that it's as real as it gets there. Let me advance here. All right, um, on top of that, we had a, a bizarro type incident at the JFK Library about four miles away out in uh, Dorchester. And it's a, it is the John Fitzgerald Kennedy Library. Um, the cause of that fire has been deemed careless disposal of smoking materials. Uh, but anybody that went in that fire, which was my ladder company, will tell you that cigarettes burning, some people stuffed in there that doesn't burn, shouldn't knock down walls, windows, or uh, you know, ceiling tiles. But in fact, in this case, it did. And um, so I, I can't explain it any further. I honestly don't have any information on that. Um, hopefully, law enforcement will come up with a better explanation or investigation on that. So um, that's, that's one thing that re we really don't have answers for. Was it, was it part of this whole thing? I honestly don't know. Was it a remote, random thing? Who knows? All I know is my lieutenant said there was nothing in that room to burn. So I'm going with that. Um, significant positive factor is having our own fire alarm. Fire alarm is part of Local 718. They're trained to work with firefighters, you know, on our fire ground. They key into what we, what we say. P Boston Police, Boston Fire, Boston EMS all have separate dispatches. They don't intertwine. So this was significant. Plus we had our mobile command post there set up early for the pre-plan anyway. Um, so it was great having, absolutely great having those guys. And we, we just can't fathom doing it any other way, having a, you know, a police dispatcher trying to speak our terminology and and get the resources that we need. Um, the problem, one of the problems with that is, although we have the capability to cross talk with the, with the network that we have, we really, we don't talk to the police officers. I, I wouldn't be standing next to a Boston police officer and, and calling him on the radio and vice versa. And we don't talk to EMS. Um, the UCC, at least they're there and they're discussing, they say so they know, all right, you guys struck the box, you're getting a second alarm. We're bringing in an extra 100 cops. We're gonna close down this street. So there was communication trickle down. But it, but it is not direct in our city, um, just so you know. So, and the fight of, and the planned response that we had, um, the companies know which way to come in, they know which way to go. They, um, they're on one side of the marathon, on the other, they're staged. All this stuff helped, and, and it got resources uh, to where they need to be. Um, there's a detailed fire pre-plan. I'm not gonna get into that in, in the interest of time, but um, the Back Bay of Boston is one of the only parts of the city that set up like a grid. It was actually all filled in during the 16th, 17th, 1800s, little at a time, to create the back bay in the south end. So you normally think of Boston when you go downtown as you know, these twisty, skinny, narrow roads, which we do have in the north end and the west end. The back bay was all filled, so somebody said, hey, let's draw straight lines for a change, and I don't know, see what happens. So it kind of worked out in that case, and the fire trucks and big trucks can get down these streets, and, and, and they did. And the police did a great job of you know, getting us in there. So there's lesson learned. The, um, we did communicate well together um, on scene. There was, of course, some yelling and screaming, but you know, that's no different than getting out of a bar with a bunch of cops at two o'clock in the morning either. There's gonna be yelling and screaming. We're gonna go back and forth with each other, but you know, essentially, essentially it did. It was a, a fire response that initially that turned into a medical response that turned into being taken over by the police that turned into taken over by the feds. So um, one thing that the incident commanders weren't aware of was that it was, there were two separate incidents and, and the, you know, the three blocks apart, the chiefs, some of the chiefs that came in weren't aware that, of the two separate explosions because they didn't see it. We just assumed that everybody knew that and you know, they heard the explosions, but we didn't, we didn't realize that they got to come in and they're, they're, not, they're seeing the carnage at the finish line. They're not seeing the, you know, the, the carnage that was two and a half blocks away. Um, one of the other lessons learned is we got to train more guys to emergency response to terrorism. We gotta have guys looking for more, look out for more for you know, tertiary devices, additional devices, keep your head on a swivel. Uh, very few deployed their mini radiac radiation detectors, which we 
lobbied hard to, to get on every rig, and there's four on every rig. And until we went around some of the hazmat guys and, and asked them to deploy them, uh, it turned out there was zero radiation readings in this case, thank God. Um, one of the other tough things, I've, one of the other things of toughness I noted from people were there was a surgeon that, that finished the Boston Marathon right as the bombs blew up, and then he ran an additional five miles to his hospital and was in his scrubs, still in his sneakers, that he ran the marathon and operating on people. I thought that was incredible. On the other side of it is, is to hold yourself back. A uh, lieutenant, a very good friend of mine, was in charge of the decon unit that day, and he said it took everything in his power not to take him and his crew to run to help the people at the finish line but because he knew that he had a greater good there, that he was there for a specific purpose. So standing by your post at some points was significant. I, I thought that was great. And we also had two firefighters that ended up going directly in the OR holding arteries and holding tourniquets on. Um, let me touch on the tourniquets for a minute. Those blue tourniquets to start IVs, those are no good in these situations. Um, firefighters were coming back to the firehouse holding up their pants covered in blood because they had to take their belt off to use as a tourniquet and then the pants were falling down and they were you know, saturated. So um, you know, get, get good heavy duty tourniquets, get them in your medical kit. In fact, get bigger medical kits than the little fanny packs that we had walking around with and we have done that. So that was a lesson learned. We do not have enough trauma dressings. Um, and the IFF does provide that two day ERT, emergency response to terrorism course, which you know, they send out guys a lot smarter than me and it, it, you know, learn, this, learn what to look for, learn what to, you know, what, uh, what needs to be done in these situations. Because this, this is not the last time that it's gonna happen. Uh, it's a terrible event that went extremely well. Uh, police barricades, they're tough to pull apart, guys. Train on them. You know, we need to, you know, we, you've seen, if anyone, you know, unless you lived under a rock, you saw the video of them pulling apart the police barricades and having a really tough time doing it. Even the cops were having a tough time doing it, and they know how to put them together. So, um, so the tourniquets, the radiation detection, I touched on that. Um, and, you know, the, the best practices or the standards or the OSHA standards is, I don't want to say specifically OSHA standards, but there are standards that, and some SOPs that say that we shouldn't be responding in until it's been swept clear of devices. But in this case, it absolutely, it had to happen. Lives, lives were definitely saved. You know, these, these scumbags put these backpacks down right next to Martin Richard, an eight-year-old boy from Dorchester, Mass. This had a human effect. Not to mention that the firefighters there on detail knew him and their kids played hockey together, and their daughters went to Irish step dancing together, and he lived in the same neighborhood as me and Ed Kelly, and we, you know, we knew, these, knew these people. So um, it, was, it was hard as well to, you know, to, to see the faces, and we wanna, I wanna thank the CISD team, our critical incident stress team that we you know, helped put in place through Local 718, were exceptional. You have to have that in place, guys. You know, they were at the firehouse when we was, before we were even deconning blood off of our hands. They were talking to us. They were telling us not to go to the bars, which we kind of went to afterwards, but very briefly. It was very briefly, sir. Um, so keep in your prayers, Matthew Richard, the Richard family, uh, Lucy Liu, Christy Campbell, and in the aftermath of this, during the manhunt and the chase, we lost a uh, police officer, MIT police officer, Sean Collier, who confronted these two scumbags. And uh, you know, may they rot in hell forever. Boston is strong, we're never gonna give up. And we wanna thank you for all the support that you guys gave us.